Don't believe everything you watch. I know. Apparently. I at least not tell my advisor. So, I guess we should probably turn that third display off. Huh? So, yeah, um, I'm really good about having big thoughts. So, I have to be like, I have some you look good, Johnny. Thank you. Thanks, John. It's been a wild morning already. Yeah. Um, here's a chair. Uh, looks like there's one or two there. I'm sorry. I've been noticed that we are running the street. Okay. Awesome. Let's have that conversation after today. Yeah, I, mean, I have an idea. Um, minimal. Yeah, that's why you have it. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Let me get this giant bag out of your way. It's great. It's working fantastic. So worship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will. I will absolutely personally commit to it. Oh, we 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 got it all figured. That's awesome. We're great. We're great. Cool. So, do you want to give me a place where I should stand? Uh, that's more Ben's thing. Okay. Yes, we discussed that. And how do we turn this guy off? Oh, yeah. Uh, so we might have like a bit of a weather map over here. Okay. Pretty much see yourself on the monitor. It was cool. You were more light here. Um, can we go a little bit? I know. Yeah. Yeah, let's try and get Johnny a little bit more light. <laughs> Right, we're, do you have the camera where you want it? I can go all the way back because we're going to do the slides as well, right? What's up? A little bit left for slides. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is good. Uh, Dan's the only one in swinging range. Hi, this is as up as it goes. Uh, oh, yeah, we can try that. Um, so there's the two lights instead of just the one. Okay, so we can do all three if you want all three. I think two is going to be good. Okay. Thank you so much. A little delay throws you off. It's it is like, a little bit. Yeah, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> so I think just like right in between the screens. Yeah. Right in between the screens. What do you mean? Yeah. Right there. It's basically right here. It's good that that's up over there. But all the girls in front of the camera. Thanks so much. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's working out good. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's just one or two years, I think. Yeah. I'm used to sitting next to you. Thank 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 you.
Actually, we're not brought So I think we're ready to get started. Good morning. Shall we? Needs a chair. Anybody more chairs in here? <laughs> well, if we have others coming in, they can find a seat for themselves. So. Okay. If I had a bow tie, I'd introduce you, but I'm way underdressed, and I think well, you should how just introduce down. yourself. Well, go right ahead. All right, well, I'm Johnny, and uh, Dr. Seeger is my advisor and the chair of my committee, so I want to thank you all for being here today. This is just incredibly exciting for me to, to share what I've been working on and what I feel so very passionate about, and, um, and especially, I can't help but say, my kids are here to witness this too, and just got to put that right up front, and it's extra special for me that way. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of my proposal, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the concepts. I'll try to hit the research questions, uh, the important um, issues about why these things are important to me, and then we'll work through them as we, as we go through the slides. But we'll just jump right in. Essentially, once, what I'm proposing to study is the relationships between human resilience, human development, and critical infrastructure. And as these relationships um, impact one another, impact and influence one another, due to the human intention, human motivation, human agency that engages and dialectically interacts with the technology, and giving rise to a maze of biopsychosocial systems, environmental systems, technical systems, cultural systems, um, ecologies and scales, things get very, very complex very, very fast. And so what I'm suggesting is that we need to try to sort these things out, understand these relationships, and begin to um, wonder, work how we can use it to our advantage when things like this happen. So if we think about what we do know, what, what kind of experiences have we had that we can actually learn from? Hurricane Katrina comes up again and again because it's a classic case study. Um, there were multiple failures across multiple domains, um, technology domains, operational domains, uh, leadership domains, and the failures cascaded, they amplified, and it was just an awful mess. I mean, I think many of you probably know about what the situation was there. And it turns out to be uh, still a continuing learning opportunity. So my first semester on campus, um, uh, this Hurricane Katrina came into the dialogue around the research that I was investigating, and, and lo and behold, the former mayor of um, New Orleans was uh, began a 10-year sentence for uh, corruption during Hurricane Katrina. So while the, and what they pointed out is while the hurricane was actually bearing down, and in the time afterwards, he was wheeling and dealing and cutting deals with his friends and putting money in his pocket, and it was just... So this points to the, uh, the human dimension, and it's one type of failure, one type of catastrophic event that we experience. Um, you may think of it in terms of event-driven. So there's an event, like there's a hurricane, or there's someone flies a plane into a building, or, it's, it, or it mathematically it's an impulse function. It just happens. It happens right now. And then there are other types of events. There are other types of events. But um, first, in between Hurricane Katrina, there was federal policy that was enacted. PPD 21 says that we want to acknowledge that the, the current infrastructure is holistic, acknowledging the interdependence, the interconnectedness of critical infrastructure. And what I'm suggesting in my research is we got it wrong about what is holistic, and we left out the people. In other words, the dimensions of how people interact 
with technology, in particular the social technical dimensions, have uh, they're absent. They're just not even there. And so if we fast forward um, to Flint, Michigan, I imagine every, everybody knows about Flint. We know what that means. So um, this is an example of what we might call a long tail event or a long timeline event. So in contrast to an event that happens like an earthquake or a, a hurricane, this is something that you know degraded over time. And unfortunately, the human dimension that was brought out um, it, what we find out, of course, it's not just about the technology, it's about the people. And in fact, just two days ago, um, criminal charges were filed against three government employees and more are expected. So there's a similar kind of trait that we're seeing here and um, around these kind of catastrophic events. And in this case, what is especially sad is there was tampering of evidence, of um, manipulating test results, uh, delaying disclosure of important vital information that has direct impact on, on people. So these two events kind of frame an emphasis of maybe a big why or a sense of direction or a sense of purpose about what this research is about. And so I put forward in the form of a couple of questions, I'll leave them open for the moment, but resilient people require resilient technology. Seems reasonable. And the flip side of that is resilient technology required. I had that reversed. Resilient technology resilient got my point. Um, and we'll interrogate this with the solved processes. The solved processes we'll talk about more very shortly. Sensing, anticipating, adapting, and learning. So essentially a lens that helps us to look into these dynamic relationships and understand what is the interconnectedness, what are the interdependencies, and how do they impact one another. So that leads me to research questions, and I'm summarizing the research questions here. But from a theoretical perspective, uh, perspective what are the relationships, the properties, the characteristics um, that we look for in people, the resilient characteristics, and what are the properties and infrastructure that we look to to relate to so that we can combine and compare those things? And then from a conceptual, how can we impact and assess? How can we measure? Is there a way understanding these relationships then to actually implement uh, interventions that may enhance or strategically uh, move us in a direction that we would like to go? And then from an operational point of view, are there uh, frameworks and heuristics, are there tools that we can construct that will actually help us to align with a more holistic approach to critical infrastructure and to integrate uh, the people into the process? So with these questions in mind, I propose four journal articles. These will be peer-reviewed journal articles. Now, I'm not going to go through all the detail in this. It's essentially the discussion in the slides that follow. But it shows you here in a very succinct form, first off, how the papers are linked, what the different contributions are, identify the knowledge gaps and the key research questions and the big why about what they're, what they're actually about. So with this in mind, then I'll jump right into the first slide and what back to the question of holism what we recognize in resilience uh, science is that there's nearly a dozen academic um, disciplines where that have publications about resilience it's just it's all over campus so you have these silos of resilience knowledge and there's no linkage between them there's no overarching holistic integrative uh, structure or form or theory or concept that brings these things together and part of this work is suggesting this is something that we really need so when we think about all these different perspectives of resilience and take an extreme like engineering and psychology how could they potentially inform one another how could they enhance one another to bring a deeper broader understanding about how what the relationships are and how they may be able to impact one another. Um, but at the, at the moment, looking into this, it's confusion and misinterpretation. So there's uh, researchers um, differ in concepts, they differ in definitions, um, there's differences in how um, what is actually emphasized and what is not emphasized. And one of the common themes uh, through all of this is any reference to holism is um, is skewed, and in my view, it is frankly incomplete. And 
in that, I mean, we need to be able to consider multiple perspectives simultaneously. So how can we do that? So if we consider um, psychology and engineering, for example. So psychology, it actually, there's a, a dimension of resilience study, and I'm only going to show a couple, couple examples here. But one approach to resilience in psychology studies the internal properties of a person. Uh, Self-esteem, locus of control, uh, self-efficacy. Um, these are things that are correlated with re human resilience, human resilient um, uh, cap capacities and capabilities. And that's an interior dimension. And likewise, we have, there's an entire body of research knowledge in psychology about resilience that takes a behavioral perspective. So this perspective looks at exterior processes and kind of boo-hoos and discounts and says, yeah, that's there, but it's not really that important. So you have these opposing, and, and this is just to illustrate that we have these two perspectives, and they can both be right at the same time. But uh, currently, that has not been the, the approach. And I'm suggesting that a holistic approach is one that is capable of holding diverse perspectives simultaneously in such a way that one is not mar marginalized or privileged over another. And then, um, and engineering and technology are like, what interior? Um, that's, that's, uh, there's, there, it's not even there. So uh, back to the idea of a holistic approach to what is critical infrastructure, we have these diverse disciplines with these perspectives that are just oftentimes not even acknowledging one another. So this paper is intended to interrogate that and to bring it out. And to do so, I propose using uh, integral theory and using an integral map in particular that will allow us to look at how these different perspectives may be arranged or organized in some sort of a coherent, meaningful, and logical way. So this, um, when, if we apply the integral map, it doesn't add information or content or change a definition per se. It simply adds clarity about perspective. And more specifically, although I won't go into this, it adds clarity about epistemological perspective from an academic, uh, in academic terminology. So the integral map is very simple. The interior and exterior of the individual and the group. So in simple terms, I have my personal experience standing up here and speaking with you, what's going on in my head that I'm not saying. You have your individual personal experience. And then there's an external personal experience of me being here. And then internally, we all share some kind of common awareness right now. If you look around the room, you know, you might see somebody that you, you kind of get it or you don't get it. Some of you may share an idea that, wow, this is interesting, and maybe others, like, what the heck is he talking about? But that's the shared experience. And then externally, as we all interact with one another on a system level, this is how we, um, how we come together and interpret things. So these the lens of the integral map will help us to look at how resilience may be considered uh, from multiple perspectives simultaneously. So what I did is I looked at, um, I reviewed 20 journal articles, the top 20 articles with the name resilience in the title, and I read those articles and I applied the integral lens, or the integral heuristic, if you will. And what that showed me is that, um, first off, the, all the top 20 articles were grouped in child psychology, adult psychology, neuroscience, technology, um, social ecological systems, and ecology. So right away the field was narrowed in terms of, well, who are the top 20? And then in terms of how the perspectives played out, now these colored regions, they're showing perspectives on both sides. So it was four articles and they, they're actually able to show two perspectives. Ideally, each article would show four. Each article would have representation in each quadrant. And interestingly, we see that there's complete absence in the lower left. And to basically put that same information into a, a little chart, what this is showing is that each, each quadrant has a potential for 100% in order to have a complete holistic perspective of, and as we go through each one, we see what the representation is. And so from an indexing perspective, that tells us that not even one third of the potential in terms of a holistic, truly holistic representation of resilience information from the way these were cited, from the way that these were selected. Does that make sense? Anybody? Give me a nod. Um, 
Okay, so that sums up uh, integral resilience then applies the integral framework. It gives us an understanding of what is holistic and why it's important. And then that carries forward and provides a framework that we then apply to the research that follows. The very next paper is a framework paper. And there I'm introducing the SOL processes, sensing, and anticipating, adapting, and learning. And I guess my little piece with this is acknowledging and perhaps emphasizing or bringing forward the recursive and reciprocal nature between the, the component elements or the elements of this and uh, coming up with this drawing to represent. So it turns out the social technical processes are very, very key because they are the common linkage to all of the different perspectives. And we've used this in our resilience uh, infrastructure class, for example, where people working on power, people working on uh, water, others working on the human dimension. And the common factor is there's this social technical framework, this social technical lens way of looking at those things, and that becomes a common integration point for us. So this is uh, very key to introduce this at this point. And then when I approached, um, first began studying this, and I looked in the literature, I could not find a definition of a resilient infrastructure problem that included social technical processes. But frankly, I, don't, I haven't seen a resilient infrastructure problem definition. And so I set out to uh, construct one. And first recognizing that we have social, ecological, and technical systems that are always interacting with one another. And then there are boundary conditions and context within which they are set. Example might be context, hurricane hits the city of New Orleans. A boundary condition might be, well, we're only going to study the power plant and what happened there. So there's just ways to delineate that and to put it into, get closer to an actual engineering problem. And then interpreting these relationships and dynamics through the social technical processes. And in the framework of resilience, acknowledging that there are protective factors, there are vulnerability factors, and there are stresses or system shocks. And altogether, this, this formulates the problem. Well, let's see, we've got two more items here, domains and dimensions. So domains, this is where we begin to see the, a component from the integral resilience. We're looking at the internal and the external or I use the words endogenous and exogenous, internal causal, external causal, in relationship to the uh, resilience, and then dimensions, uh, space and time, and then one you probably may have not heard before, meaning. And this is very, very key, and it'll come in uh, a little bit later, but um, Holling, who's one of the leading researchers, uh, acknowledged that whenever humans are involved in a resilience uh, framework, then there is an ex third dimension that needs to be added, which is meaning. And meaning, then, that leads directly into meaning making and how we do that, and that will, um, we'll touch on that shortly. So essentially, what this gives us, what the resilience conceptual framework gives us is now a problem definition of what is resilient infrastructure, uh, how do we approach a problem, what are the minimum components that we need. In fact, um, a total count was nine components or items. And uh, a, this work, um, a piece of this work has been done. I created a scorecard, and that scorecard has been used in a literature review that some others here are leading um, to identify elements of resilient perspectives and then draw conclusions and we'll be uh, working with that. So a piece of this is already put into motion on some other projects. So now, as we look forward into the third paper, Human Resilience, now, the intention here is to understand how human resilience impacts and influences critical infrastructure resilience. And first, in order to understand what our, what our perspective is and how we're approaching it, we recognize there is a social ecology to infrastructure. And that social ecology includes individuals, groups, organizations, and institutions. And the area of my focus is individuals and, and groups. And by groups, I mean Groups that are close in and proximal, they may be working in the same room. Uh, they interact with technology. They can actually touch the buttons or physically interact. They're not the ones in a remote tower somewhere, you know, calling the shots. So it's looking very specifically at a, at a core group of, uh, of individuals and emphasizing that we have biological systems and psychological systems, and my work is focused on these psychological systems. Now, 
we, uh, we can see we're starting to integrate from uh, paper number one into paper three. Now, I kind of jumped ahead here with uh, expanding out this center diagram, but this shows how we would apply the framework of a resilient problem definition to or how we get an integral perspective of that. So inside this circle is the unit or region of inquiry, of investigation. And here we're looking at the social technical network. So how do those networks uh, interact with one another? And you recognize the four components, the PVSO, that's the protective factors, vulnerability factors, stressors, and outcomes. So essentially the entire framework of that prior drawing right here, that entire framework is reduced to these four letters and then embedded into another framework that says now we have four dimensional perspectives of this. So that's, that's what's intended to be communicated. Now my work, my research is emphasized, is these two, so the orange and the blue, and that's to then clarify that this is where my focus is. And I'm looking at those. Now clearly there is representation in the other quadrants. There are correlates. Um, I do make some reference to those. The most direct reference would be um, as an individual who is a leader and a leader in a group and thereby this work is immediately reflected uh, down into this, this quadrant. So one possible way that human resilience may interact with uh, critical infrastructure resilience is something like this. And what I've done is, uh, in my review of the human development and the human resilience literature, they're in defining uh, the, some call them personal traits, some call them variables, they call them characteristics. Um, these properties of human resilience, they can be broadly characterized into groups of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. And in addition, not just in the human resilience, but it turns out in the human development literature, you see similar reference to cognitive, emotional, and behavioral dimensions. So what I'm suggesting here is that one way in which um, those internal properties may interact with our social technical processes is something like this. And we don't know what the relationships actually are. That's why we stop at the border. There's recursive and reciprocal um, integration that's happening back and forth. But this is something uh, that we're I'm putting forward as an idea about how we may consider looking at human resilience and critical infrastructure. And again, this is very important because humans are embedded in infrastructure. Humans design, manage, and operate infrastructure. So we in engineering for, uh, have historically focused on the technology, and yet we forget that people operate the technology and interact with the technology. And one of my uh, examples, it's a little silly, but a worker goes into the control plant and every day he does the same thing. He's the same person and he, every day he goes in, he pushes, he turns this knob right and this knob left. One day he goes in and he does it the opposite. Why? Why do people do the things that they do? Why do people misrepresent test results over extended periods of time? Why did these kind of things happen? So this research asks that big question and actually leads right into the fourth paper, which is um, about human development and critical infrastructure. And human development answers the question why. So uh, in engineering, we ask a lot of what, and uh, we, we also ask why, but the, the, the point here is that not just why someone did something the way they did, but why in terms of what their actual capacity was and what their actual ability was. So what we're looking at here, this is a little overwhelming, I know, but these are uh, vertical bars representing stage models, different stages of development, and they emphasize different areas of human development. And my focus is on the one labeled maturity. The construct is eagle development. Uh, it answers the big question of who am I? Um, and the reason that I use this is it gives us uh, specific stages of meaning making and meaning making is even is the very uh, actionable element um, that uh, describes eagle development and uh, the structure and it interprets experience so it gives us the ways to look at um, how humans interact and why we interact the way that we do the tools are established and they're validated um, 
So I chose this path. There's also uh, some other researchers ha who have done similar integration of uh, aligning eagle development with human resilience uh, for other types of studies in psychiatry and so forth, but that was also an influence on picking this. Um, so if we zoom in on this, uh, Cook Reuter did a study where uh, for about 4,500, just over 4,500 participants, and gave this distribution of uh, that roughly is approximate to how uh, representative of our general population. And uh, this data was collected over 15 years, I believe it was. So um, it's pretty solid. And it's been corroborated. The general trend, the general um, behavior has been uh, corroborated in a couple of other studies with several hundred, not thousands, but several hundred. And, but the base, basic message is that um, the bulk of the developmental stages are in what we call the earlier form. And there's a uh, a critical juncture whereby a systems thinking capacity comes online and a capacity not just for systems thinking but systems or meta systems and multiple systems and this correlates with levels of complexity both in the individual and in the environment and the reason this is important is because people may be faced with situations whereby the complexity of the environment the technology environment that they're faced with exceeds their psychological complexity or capacity to effectively interact. They saturate and get in uh, whatever may happen there, but that uh, effectiveness is lost. And that emphasizes why we believe that this is very important. And so I'm focusing on a particular group, uh, the latter two and the first two after that transition, and showing that when we look just at that group, that uh, it appears that maybe up just right at or just over 80% of the population, the general population that we would consider having the properties, desirable properties in a resilient uh, circumstances situation like we're thinking about in, a, in this uh, infrastructure environment. 80% of them are at earlier stages. And this is, this is something we need to look at and something that I believe is um, uh, very critical and very important and that we need to understand what the relationships are between these different uh, levels and how to encourage, uh, uh, inspire transitions, how to strategically move into um, positions that may be more desirable for certain kinds of situations. And that's really key is that we're able to match and align uh, individual capacities with roles and responsibilities. So, as we're nearly to the end here, um, this is looking at the four, um, the four stages that we're uh, proposing to examine or the ones that we're most interested in. And here across the top, I had the social technical processes. And the question is, well, what? What are the relationships? How, what, what would we expect to see? And how would that, uh, how would that change? And if we now integrate the model from our previous one, now it comes together, now we begin to get a visual. And this is representative. I don't know that it's exactly that. We don't really know what, exactly what it is. But it does um, provide a way to get a perspective of the full integration of human resilience, human development, and critical infrastructure. And the, the element that integrates the infrastructures, the social technical processes, um, we're looking at resilience and development on uh, the other side. And one possibility, now this is now I'm thinking and imagining, I'm anticipating as in the solid processes, one possibility of what we may expect to see is may, might be something like this. So we have a way to examine uh, with some level of granularity the developmental capacities in people that perhaps correspond to the types of uh, capacities that we would desire to have in infrastructure environment, especially in catastrophic uh, situations or in, in times of uh, big change. So back to those propositions in the front end. Resilient technology requires resilient people. Resilient people require resilient technology. And there are always people involved. So, that's it.
explain uh, what happens now for our audience, especially those people who haven't been through it before or who are going to go through it soon. I want to invite the public to ask you questions, and then we're going to excuse everyone but your committee. We're going to conduct what's called an oral exam uh, with the, the, the PhD student in, who's hoping to be a candidate um, in private with the committee. And then we'll excuse you, and the committee will uh, deliberate, and we'll invite you back in. So uh, having said that, we have these guests, and they may be interested. And let's field questions. Sure. Right, please. Yes. Hey, I have a question. The, the four-figure diagram, the four boxes that you showed, um, great, great figure, um, and where you overlaid the 20 articles and resilience, oh, you know, resilience okay. title uh, specifically in that. Um, how well does that uh, overlay to the, the larger body of thinking just on critical infrastructure um, in general? Okay, so how does the integral map, I believe is what you're, the four boxes, right? right. And how does that relate to critical infrastructure yeah. so, in general? So, so I, I understand that the limitations of only one human being and, and right. Google Scholar to right. review articles and right. place them on the map. But if you could, you know, give some insight into sure. that as a representative sample. Yeah, of, no, that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. So basically, critical infrastructure in that map, in uh, my opinion, is the lower right quadrant. It describes the systems perspective and systems interaction and dy dynamics. It does not account for the interior dimension of human interaction. And that's where the value of the map comes. It's almost like you have this heuristic or this holistic uh, lens, and uh, like shining a black light, you, know, you, you see something that's not there. Now, you haven't changed anything. It just allows a, a, a greater discernment in, in seeing more granularity in these epistemologies. And what we see right now is there uh, in, at least in my view, and I believe shared by others in the room, that the epistemologies in critical infrastructure currently do not acknowledge human interiority. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah close, but, but okay. that's good. That's good. I'll let okay. someone else go. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. So thank you, and it's been it's fantastic to see integral theory that I heard about a couple years ago and all the work you've done. So. Really, really good work. Yeah, this all started in Sarah's class. <laughs> so, um, speaking of interiority, we didn't hear much about your interiority and what led you to be interested and passionate about this. And so, I'm interested if you could say a little okay. bit about that. Yeah, and sure then also, um, yeah, I know we're in the hard sciences, so we're not supposed to bring in the subject, but you're, so, you're saying that we need to bring in the subject, right? And then also, um, if what is the most important thing that we are going to be able to do in the world because of what you're developing here? Ultimately, make better decisions. Right? The simple, quick answer would be that we would make better decisions. And of course, there's a story behind that, which means we have the people that we perhaps believe are best uh, for making the types of decisions that they become responsible for and that we have them in the right uh, aligned in the roles and responsibilities that support those capacities. It, so it's it, kind of matching the capacity of the person with the job. So we would kind it, of in look a at sense, like, that's a, that's you can't a, be the emergency director here because you don't have the ego, you know. If there's a, a, a deficiency, and it, and it gets a little gingerly to, to start talking about these kind of things. But clearly, it's, which is why I kind of take it to the, let's be clear that we have roles and responsibilities matched with individual capacities and, and ability. And then that takes away a little bit of the sting that <coughs> oh, I'm less than or I should be something more. It's, it's really about the role. And everyone has a, an appropriate role. All of the different uh, stages and levels have very important contributions to make. And they're all welcome and they have valued places. But if we don't know what they are and we can't assess or align them with uh, the responsibilities that we have, then we're challenged. Does that help? It does help. Yeah. Thank you. You did not answer my first question. But oh, and, oh, my personal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I mean, so. Shapes and colors is the entire thing, right? 
how did I end up here? Well, gosh, that's another story. That's, that story might be better for later, but um, I'll just say that after, uh, after 20 plus years in professional uh, engineering and business, and after kind of sitting on my hands, uh, doing some personal writing for a while, wondering what I was going to do next, I got introduced to something called sustainability. I wondered what the heck is that. And I scratched beneath the surface, long story short, uh, got a couple of consulting projects that got me exposed to it. And then I almost immediately recognized a connection between human development and sustainability. And human development is something I've been studying for a dozen years in, in depth in numerous different ways. And when I recognized there was an opportunity to combine something that was so near and dear to my heart and important to me with something, well, with two things in, in such a way, it was, it was just, okay, where, where am I going to do this? Where am I going to go? And it became a journey uh, to sort that out and find it. And that journey led me to right here. So thank you for asking. And it feels a little vulnerable to say that. Yes, Dan. Um. I actually had a, a, a question, but it bounces off of Daniel's thing, and okay. I want to clarify something I think okay. I understand now. Um, the integral map that he showed was for resilience in general, right? That's why you're asking about critical infrastructure. And I was wondering why focus on the upper left corner, you said you're open like in systems, when right. you showed that the lower left is the empty yeah. part. No, that's a great question. But I think what you're trying to say is if you were doing the critical infrastructure mapping, the upper left is still empty, relatively speaking. So it's the work that you're doing, doing is filling yes. a large gap in the critical infrastructure yeah. realm yeah. where that general map was may have shown that, oh, no, there's tons of research already that you could have drawn on. Is that, am I interpreting that That's, correctly? You're interpreting that correct. In fact, and I'm sorry if I didn't get your question correct, but if I were to place critical infrastructure in the map, it would only be in the lower right. There'd be nothing else in any right. of the other three quadrants. And, and back that answers to, my question, though. Right, and then back to why am I doing the individual in that gap? Well, first of all, to, for, in my view, to study a group, I got darn well better be able to understand an individual first. And just to leapfrog over the individual of the group doesn't feel right or natural to me. So I believe it's an area that's ripe for investigation. Perhaps there's other researchers here that might consider uh, interrogating that space. But, um, and I do think there's some carryover to my work, especially in the form of leadership of groups. So when we look at leaders as individuals and what they bring and then how, they, uh, how that influences the groups that they, that they work with. Yes? Maybe uh, another way to frame it is if you were to use a different sampling method, you might find that the lower left-hand quadrant, which deals with culture, isn't as empty as you think. Um, if you were to look at the disciplines of geography or anthropology or law, um, you might discover that if you were to cast a little wider net that you have some coverage in that cultural quadrant, but that, and it might shine a light even more on that intentional quadrant up in the upper left and make your case even a little stronger. Just so, okay, great, and, and that point well taken. And let me be clear that um, what I'm actually emphasizing here is less about the results and more about how the tool is used. So in other words, it's a cursory look to say, uh, hey, look, let's, let's do this sample, the resilience in the title, and top 20 you know, in terms of citations, and let's look at that and see where they fall, and it illustrates sort of how to apply. Clearly, there are other ways to approach in different types of research, although arguably, when it comes to resilience, I think it's still pretty light down there, and when it comes to critical infrastructure, it is vacant. That's in my opinion. Yeah. Yes? This is a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, my question is um, regarding the third and fourth aspect of your thesis. Are you going to dwell on a case study where you can demonstrate how this framework can be applied practically or emphasize the importance of humans in, in, in technology systems and resilience? It, my papers are theoretical and conceptual in nature, and so I will not be apprehending data or making, uh, yeah, making knowledge claims that way. So uh, how it's going to pan out and then be exemplified, I don't know yet um, how to bring that into a case study. So it's a TPD. I got another question. Yes. 
you had some really good negative examples of people that you would argue don't have these capacities yes. that if they were to have them, maybe we wouldn't have experienced as horrible of things in Flint or Katrina. So are there other positive case studies of people that you think have the developmental level that you're considering and have dealt with these things in a better way? Or there was less like, that just never reaches the news. Yeah, I, well, I, a combination, first answer, if I were to put something up, I, I have a slide that has a, a photograph inside the Situation Room at the White House. And I would like to think that that is representative of a group that has perhaps the properties and characteristics that we're, we're looking for. How do I know? I don't know. I mean, I don't, without going in and actually making measures, and historically the way engineering research has been done is something happens and we study it. Something happens and we study it. Now, hopefully we'll get to the point where we are able to look forward with insight about how to apply this to be able to better answer those kind of questions. I don't think we're quite there just yet. But that hopefully would be the intention of the direction we would move. Um, and in the spirit of that, I, it's been a challenge and, and some discussion amongst us to think of the so-called positive uh, events versus a negative event. And a negative event means bad things happen and we study bad things. But the good things happen, like Dan said, and we don't know about it because it doesn't get to the news and we just never hear about it. How can we direct our attention to understand the things that actually work? Well, there's one example, and I don't know how to quite get to it, but to plant a seed with those of you uh, thinking about these kind of things, the Mosul Dam in uh, Mosul, Iraq, is uh, the U.S. government has issued two very stern uh, international warnings about the danger of this dam, and they're calling it the world's most dangerous dam. There are one and a half million people in the floodplain uh, below this dam that would that would see a tsunami, literally a tsunami in the desert of about 70 feet of water. And so the U.S. government has taken it upon themselves, even though what is their interest in the air? Well, I won't go there. Um, They've taken it upon themselves to make this announcement and emphasize the importance, and yet nothing has happened yet. The dam has not collapsed. Today it's standing there, and yet you hear the story, and it's like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very, and and perhaps it, it will, it will watch and see how that plays out, and if we can discern um, how these things play, or like the, the dam failure that we watched in the video, and. Some number of people will run in the situation, and others will turn and walk straight into it. Why? Why did those people, why did those seven engineers go back in and take it upon themselves when everyone, even the people that were responsible for the, um, uh, the critical respond, the first responders were running? Everybody else was running in any of these engineers. So. One thing to consider that Dave Woods mentioned when he was talking here was when people get caught, or when things are found, a lot of people will blame, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Like when they take a stock market off because they think something's gonna go wrong, they lose a bunch of money because they shut it down for an hour, but they took that proactive action. The entire industry says that was a horrible decision, but from the perspective of more resilience or positive case mm -hmm. study, they're being proactive about those damages. So right. a lot of the press that is still negative might be construed as a positive case study from a resilience perspective, and, and the likes of the Mosul Dam might be one that we can go with. Well, and I think your comment points to the challenge that human beings have with the time dimension. And we're thinking about things in terms of time and change, and we're fixed on what's happening right now, and our attention is often very localized. So if what's in front of us is broken or not servicing our need, that we think, why didn't they, whoever they are, make it work? And they might be thinking about a much larger hole and turn that thing off because there's some other situation. So it's a, it's a web, it's a, quite a maze. Johnny, I thank you again. Uh, one more time with a round of applause and excuse people. And
we should not be uh, live streaming the oral exam, right. uh, but instead bringing Susan in via Skype or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking I'll just set up my computer and your work here is done. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Okay. Does Susan know? I'll um, text her. Yeah. That's all right. Okay.